today's speaker he is the one that wind diesel looks like so let's just welcome welcome him with a clap thank you thank you anil um, i wish i looked like wind diesel but then i guess uh, because of uh, i mean probably i am the closest who comes to wind diesel among this uh, in this congregation so you know i will accept it okay so uh, last week uh, we had an introduction to this uh, new series that we are doing on uh, uh, hebrews and uh, the name of our series is christ our on- our only hope and um, we want to thank ajay for this uh, beautiful uh, um, you know this uh, visual that he has made and uh, i saw it last week and then uh, this morning i was uh, wondering you know what i should do i looked in my wardrobe and see what is the best that i can match you know <laughs> these colors and you know th- this this is what i found me closest you know where i could uh, match this particular uh, slide here so uh, today you know, we are going to look at uh, hebrews chapter 1 and uh, we live in a society that recognizes the necessity of good communication the millions are spent on persuasive advertising and highly developed techniques of techniques have emerged over the years and you will see that whether it's politicians speaking to the masses or whether it is diplomats who are handling or whether you have diplomats who are handling international affairs or even it is family life and marriages we know that any breakdown in communications is disastrous so when you come to this letter to the hebrews what we see is the author is describing the majesty of christ and this letter it actually begins by asserting the greatest single fact of the christian revelation that god has spoken to humanity through his word in the bible and through his son jesus and we sang today you know you are my daily bread your very word spoken to me so in christ god has closed the greatest communication gap of all time that exists between god and man so this uh, particular letter is addressed to the hebrews and the hebrews are the first century jewish christians and that is those are the people that this letter is addressed to so if we look at the context and we see how the majesty of christ is described here uh, the context it seems like perhaps these uh, first century jewish christians they had abandoned their faith because they no longer recognized christ's deity and equality with god so the author's first task here is to expound and exalt on god's son so he talks about jesus and the majesty of christ here and so the question that comes to us is okay maybe the first century christians uh, jewish christians um they were worshiping yahweh and then uh, you know suddenly to equate jesus with god it maybe may have been difficult for us so the question you ask is is this relevant for us today and uh, you will say that you know i am not as fickle minded as you know those jewish christians but the thing is the enemy you know is at work um in ever so subtle ways and sometimes combined with our own circumstances and some of the turmoil that we go through we do stand a chance of second guessing and so this message is also relevant for us today so we'll uh, look at hebrews chapter 1 and i will read uh, read through verses 1 to 14 that's hebrews chapter 1 in the past god spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son 
whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So this is what the author writes to these first century Jewish Christians. And the author reminds his readers of eight things about Jesus here. Number one, Jesus is God's prophetic voice. Jesus is God's prophetic voice. Um, the author mentions that God spoke at different times by different means. And we know this because when we read through the Old Testament, we see how God spoke through prophets. But in Christ, he spoke fully, decisively, finally, and perfectly. When you uh, read the book of prophets, for example, you read Ezekiel. Ezekiel portrayed the glory of God. But it was Christ who reflected it. And Isaiah expounded the nature of God as being holy and righteous and being merciful. But Christ manifested it. Jeremiah described the power of God. But it is Christ who displayed it. So Jesus far surpassed the best of prophets of earlier times. And the author is saying that these wavering Christians must listen to his voice. So this letter actually encourages us to reaffirm our confidence in a God who has spoken clearly to humanity in scripture and in his son. And so Christ is the greatest prophet with a distinctive message for these last days. And that is what the author writes. Then again, he goes on to talk about Jesus is God's son. Jesus is God's son. So those Jewish Christians whose faith was faltering, you know, they may have come to regard him as a good man and a captivating teacher and an impressive leader, but he was much more. He is the son of God. And without the son, without the work of the son, you know, there is no salvation. So those who deliberately and persistently spurn the Son of God, they cannot be possibly brought to repentance because they have opposed the truth revealed by God and they have despised the life approved by God by rejecting the Savior. And the author is saying that Jesus is the real deal. And if you are looking to the law and the prophets, they all point to Jesus. 
and he is God's son. And then he goes on to say that Jesus is God's appointed heir. So Christ was appointed heir of all things. And the author intends to say that, he intends to convey to us that the Lord Jesus, he will inherit not only the earth, but the entire universe. So the son obviously comes into a rich inheritance and the New Testament tells us that believers share in this inheritance. Romans 8.17 talks about believers sharing in this inheritance. So just like, uh, you know, even in our uh, everyday life or we know that in our worldly life, when you get, uh, when you marry somebody with an inheritance, you know, you get a share in the inheritance. And this author is saying that be married to this heir and have it all because it is all uh, Jesus, the son, comes into a rich inheritance. And we sang today, you know, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So this is how the author is exalting Jesus. And then he goes on to say that Jesus is God's creative agent. So he's not a mere preacher, but he shared actively in the creative work of the Almighty God. So he is not only the heir of all things, but he is also the creative agent. In other words, what the son was to possess, he was instrumental in making. So he created all things and to him uh, are all things. So surely a Christ who has shaped the universe and who has summoned the galaxy of stars into being, could guide these Jewish Christians through times of adversity and control their destiny and provide for their immediate needs. And that is what the author is trying to uh, exhort them with. And then he goes on to say, Jesus is God's personified glory. Now for the Hebrew people, the glory of God, it was a visible and outward expression of the majestic presence of Christ. If you uh, look back, when the law was given at Sinai, the glory of the God, uh, glory of God settled on the mountain. And also when the law was given at Sinai, um, uh, yeah, and also when uh, they had the tent of the meeting, the glory of God was uh, became manifest at the tent of the meeting and it was a visible sign to God's people of God's continuing presence. But uh, what happens when the ark was captured, when the ark of the covenant was captured, then the people lamented that the glory had departed. So the author here is saying that in these last days, the same glory has been seen in the person of Christ who is the radiance of God's glory. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. And surely the Jewish Christians would have recalled the glory of God in the Jerusalem temple in its uh, ceaseless rituals and sacrifices that they were making. But the author is here reminding the readers that nowhere has the glory of God been more perfectly manifest than in the person of God's Son. And that is what uh, the author is stressing here. And now he is also moving on to say that Jesus is God's perfect revelation. That Jesus bears the very stamp of God's nature and all the attributes of God become visible in him. It says he is the exact representation of his being that exactly and perfectly matches. So if we want to see God, we must look to Christ. And how could they hope to know the God that they were seeking if they were turning their backs upon Christ in whom God is perfectly revealed? Because they were seeking God, but then they were turning their backs upon Christ in whom God is perfectly revealed. Now, here the radiance of God's glory, 
it suggests a oneness of the son with the father because god's glory is being radiated at the son while also this particular aspect talks about the, a perfect copy of his nature perfect representation of his being it also maintains the distinct distinctness of the son from the father two persons but uh, one god and then jesus is god's cosmic sustainer because he is the one who keeps the planets in orbit by his authoritative and effective word of power and every jew passionately believed that the almighty god he kept the universe in the short hollow of his hand if you read isaiah 40 it says entire the lord the god almighty holds the entire universe in the hollow of his hand so he is not only the creator but also the sustainer and quite deliberately here the author uh, describes this as part of christ's present role because he speaks in the universe and what he commands is done and he has spoken to their hearts and what he demands will most certainly be accomplished so the author is again stressing here that we need a vision of christ with these immense cosmic dimensions a christ who transcends all our noblest thoughts and our best experience of him because uh, if you read if you have uh, read the book of job and you know how job asked so many questions to god and he kept on asking questions and uh, finally god appeared out of a storm and spoke and what did god say what did uh, did god answer his questions god actually if you read um, from chapter 38 onwards job 38 onwards god appeared to him in a storm and then god spoke of his magnanimous things that he has done and how he sustains even the smallest of creatures and how he controls the largest of them and he only talked about you know how uh, in those cosmic proportions that job had nothing to ask and job simply surrendered to him and uh, you know he, he had no more questions so it is uh, so the author is here talking about in these cosmic dimensions that jesus is god's cosmic sustainer and finally jesus is god's unique sacrifice so the author here emphasizes god's uh, or jesus work in redemption as well as creation so we turn from what christ Uh, or who Christ is to what Christ did and when he gave himself up on the cross Jesus shed his blood once for all at a single point in time and no repetition of the saving act will ever be necessary Christ is God's unrepeatable sacrificial provision for the greatest problem of humanity that is sin and in his own person he did for sinful people what they could never achieve by themselves and on that day he cried and he said it is finished in john chapter 19 verse 30 so after this eternal work was brought to its triumphant conclusion in the death and resurrection of christ our lord sat at the right hand of the majesty on high so the son who was humiliated on earth is now enthroned in heaven and worthy of all our honor and worship so with these points the author to the hebrews is reminding his readers about these eight things and so far we have looked at only the first three verses <laughs> of hebrews of hebrews 1 you know and then he goes on to show that jesus is infinitely superior to the angels and uh, you think why is this necessary you know why does he have to talk to these christians about this because if you look back at critical times in history god had sent angels to the to his people to reveal his will at periodic times and perhaps some of these jewish christians argued about jesus and may have said among themselves 
that he is the greatest of the angels and even created by God as a perfect angel for a special assignment among human beings. So maybe, because the way uh, the author is talking about comparing Jesus in every way to the angels and proving that he is superior, it is probably the readers were, or some of the readers were actually equating, instead of equating Jesus with God, they may be probably equating it, him as a perfect angel. So now, uh, the author goes on to uh, talk to his readers or write to his readers about Jesus being much superior to the angels, starting with his superior name. And he's saying that Christ cannot be relegated to the rank of an angel because the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs because their name just means messenger and nobody will deny that at times they were wonderfully used as God's heralds both in the Old and New Testaments we see angels come and go and that was their function but Christ has a name superior to the best of angels and he was uh, or he is far more than a mere messenger he is the son of God and then he looks at the superior dignity because the angels were worshippers but he is the son they adored. The angels united in worship and they did so because God demanded it. Let all angels worship him. That's what we see in verse 6. So in other words, it is the angel's task to exalt the son and he is obviously of far superior honor to those who God, who at God's command offer him their constant and adoring praise. So naturally he is much superior in dignity and his superior nature Angels worship Christ because they recognize him as of a totally different and far superior nature to theirs. They are servants for God's purposes, but Christ here is addressed as an incomparable deity. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So the deity of Christ is eternal in character and it's not temporary. And also the title son, it is not just a name, but it defines a relationship which is of eternal quality and lasting forever and ever as the son and also as we are God's children. It is a relationship which is of eternal quality lasting forever and ever. And then he writes about his superior role. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. So now we are assured here that Christ is sovereign. He is not only the prophet who speaks, he is not only the priest who saves, but also he is the king who rules. And the author presents Christ as the true, eternal and only king of humanity. And you can see all his regal symbolism shown here is used to heighten the understanding of this majestic Christ. And he has an eternal throne, a righteous scepter and a universal kingdom. It is true that the angels did assist him as he prepared for the cross. But he alone could bear our sins. So his role is much superior to the angels. Now he goes on to show the superior example set by Jesus. Now if you, uh, if you um, I mean we all remember reading from scripture that not all angels were good. 
You know, there were good angels and there were bad angels. So if these Jewish Christi Christians, they chose to relegate Christ to the status of an angel, could they be sure that they would always regard him as good? Because the Jewish contemporaries, they looked at Jesus as an imposter and a blasphemer. You know, those who didn't believe in Christ and those who were not uh, Jewish uh, Christians, new Jewish Christians as they were. But whatever be the precise moral quality of the angels, whether good or bad, Jesus far transcends them all. Because if you look at it, the best of the angels, the good angels, they were not exposed to the grim hazards of human temptation. Jesus was exposed to human temptation. And they were not exposed to the sinister voice of the evil one. Jesus was tested. Therefore, the fact that he lived among us as a man and not as an angel should encourage us to look again at the qualities of his rich exemplary life as well as the virtues of his sacrificial death. And this is what the writer is emphasizing. And then he goes on to talk about his superior work. The angels are nothing but creatures made for God's purposes, but Christ is God's appointed agent in the work of creation. Through him God created the worlds. And as part of the created order, the angels belong to that which is transient and temporary and that is perishing. Whereas in this fleeting world, we could always be assured of the companionship of the unchanging Lord Jesus Christ because he is the same and his ear, ears will never end. You remain the same, but your ears will never end. And then he goes and talk, talks about his superior achievement. Again, Christ uh, is being referred to as one seated in the eternal realm. No angel was ever invited to sit at the right hand of God. They gladly hurried on God's errands and they get, got it done. But their work lacked the finality of what Christ did. The finality of Christ's perfect work. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand? None indeed. Because no angel could atone for humanity as Christ did or plead for them as he now does. Angels can serve us, but they cannot save us. So his name is excellent, not only because he is a son, but also he is a savior. And finally, the author takes us through his superior destiny. God said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So no angel has ever deserved such an acclamation or such an exaltation. Actually, these angels are among the multitude of uh, ex exultant multitude that we see in John, because John, uh, uh, exiled to the island of Patmos, writes about uh, these angels, and he heard the voice of the angels among the heavens worshipping throng. And we see, uh, he writes that they adored Christ and praised him in a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. So on that great day, which is to come, every tongue will acknowledge Jesus' supremacy and that is his appointed destiny and that is his superior destiny and no angel is worthy of honor such as that. The entire host of heaven will be subject to him. And with these, the, uh, the writer is, or the author to the Hebrews is exhorting them that Jesus is far superior than the angels. And uh, let's come to, you know, first century believers, they were under the sinister threat of renewed persecution and they may have found comfort in the assurance that God's unseen messengers would help them 
in trouble because over the if we see that how god sends his angels to when his people are in trouble and they were looking for comfort to these angels and even um we have heard many testimonies from people who talk about invention uh, intervention from the angels whenever christians were in danger you know we we have heard so many stories whether they are tall soldiers with shining faces or as we read in second kings chapter 6 verse 17 There was a there were, was a hill full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. So these things are there. So the angels, God sends God sends forth his angels to serve his people and come to come to the aid of his people. But the flip side is that when you are rescued from such a traumatic experience by angels and you are overflowing with gratitude, there. Uh, you also run the risk of falling back into the cult of angels and dominions you know because you think okay it is it is those angels that have saved you and then all your worship and your allegiance actually goes to these angels so never be mistaken god alone sends forth angels to serve so the last verse in the hebrews is are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation so the author is saying the uh, christ is superior to the angels and christ is the only mediator between god and man the bible says that christ is the only mediator between god and man so now as the worship team comes up uh, to sing a hymn uh, i just wanted to uh, i'm just actually reminded of how even to this day even in christian circles uh, there are people who um, look to saints they seek the uh, intercession or the mediation of saints and then also you probably go to a place of pilgrimage or velanganni or something so these are all some of those little angels you know in your because you don't know you, you may not know mikhail or gabriel or you know who, some of those but then these are your little angels and in whom you have put your trust and the author here is to the hebrews is saying jesus is superior to the angels far superior to the angels you turn back to him and you look to him because in him we live and move and have our being thank you father we thank you for this morning lord we uh, thank you for reminding us of the deity of Christ that Christ is superior lord he takes the highest place lord his name is a name above every other name lord and let lord this morning if we have given anything or anyone else a place above our lord jesus father we pray we just we just remove that and and we and we put jesus we we ask jesus to become our lord and our king and may we remember this lord what we have heard that and apply it in our lives over every situation as we heard in our testimonies also lord over every situation over every problem over every boss or every person may we give jesus the highest place help us lord remind us lord and now may the grace of christ our savior who shed his blood for each one of us the boundless love of god the father who sent his son jesus for us and the presence of holy spirit who reminds us of the things of christ be with us now and forever amen amen